Letterpress describes printing from a raised surface. So it could be lead type, it could be wood type, it could be linoleum. It's a relief process. So a raised surface applying ink and the paper makes contact with that raised surface and the ink gets embedded into the paper. It sort of straddles craft and commercial and fine art. It's sort of a huge continuum. It's a growing community of printers and same thing is happening all over the place, but it's sort of busting wide open. It's strange that per capita we probably have way more letterpress printers than anywhere else. I can't explain that. Maybe it's something in the water. With letterpress printing, each letter has to be handset, even tiny eight-point type, six-point type. And we use a composing stick, a special tool to get that all set up. And you have a lot of nuances about, first of all, the type that you choose, and details like how it's gonna work on the paper. You can choose the paper specifically to enhance the look of letterpress printing. So I like really thick, lush handmade papers that show the impression. Offset printing doesn't have any impression, it's just flat. When I started printing 25 years ago, I was partner in a design firm and we had a press and we started incorporating letterpress printing as part of our business. And we had to try and convince people that letterpress was awesome and here's why you might want to pay to have your wedding invitation printed this way and why we sent out um, promotional materials. So the big change in, in this 25 year period is people now all know what letterpress printing is. It, I, don't, I don't have to educate anybody about it. There's a big value. On the downside, it's, as a printer, it's a lot more competitive. There's a lot more printers out there. But that makes me happy. I think it'll preserve the equipment and the interest. I, I have heard other printers worried about the bubble, that it's going to burst like it's been this fat, and I hope that's not true. Glacius is a funny word because it's, um, we don't know the etymology of it, and so it is basically a festival that a master printer put on for the underprinters, um, usually on St. Bartholomew's Day in August. Now, in modern times, it's kind of more just printers coming together. And in a lot of places that do waste use, they are a little more printer, and then ours is open to the public, so it's kind of showcasing the printer's art to the public. The public is very savvy. Like 10 years ago, they would ask questions about, you know, like, oh, do you just press buttons on a machine and then, you know, the, the type goes down and it's like, no, it's all handset, that sort of thing. And now they're pretty savvy and will come into Jessica's studio during studio tours and ask questions that I can't answer because they're that advanced. So the public knowledge has increased greatly. I started working on this exhibition, I knew I was going to be looking at uh, contemporary prints and then really start thinking about how for this community it really included letterpress and I realized I didn't know anything about it. Thankfully I was able to go um, talk to Jessica and um, talk about what, um, what letterpress was now and what this community, how it got started and what all was happening um, in the community. I knew it was very active here in Tacoma, but I was trying to look across the Northwest and so I started looking in Portland and looking in Spokane and all out in these other areas and finding it was really active. And was really curious about how you got interested in it in the first place. 
sweet because I didn't know the story of how you'd gotten working with it with King's Books and all those sorts of things. Yeah, it was kind of a natural progression. At King's Books, we do a lot of um, work with the community in different different communities, and um, Jessica Spring had come in installing an exhibit. Um, so we just kind of came up with the idea. The first waste case was six tables, and then it's just gone on from there to like, you know, over 50 artists represented and steamroller printing and everything. So it's just been kind of a natural evolution, kind of a conversation. We at the bookstore can be a, a place for different, different communities and have helped to increase the profile, I think, in Tacoma. How many years ago? We just had our tent. Ten. So, Ten. Yeah, and when did the steamroller, which is always that was the high the, point, is the, the giant seventh year? Yeah, yeah. Seventh, yeah. I think we've also seen, like, at the, especially in the first years of the Waste Goose, there'd be the curmudgeonly old printers that would come and kind of be like, what are, what are you people doing? And kind of like <laughs> testing the knowledge and asking questions in a way that we don't get as much anymore because it's kind of establish itself. I mean, there's still people that come, but there was like the, the old guard, if you will, it was kind of like, what's That's going not on? Running. Yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly. So I think that there's been education around that. Yeah, and I think the innovation has really been rewarded um, with more interest from the, the larger community when they start to understand what we're doing and appreciate it. It's pretty exciting. Well, what I found really fascinating about it and talking with you and then some of the other people you put me on to and then just getting out there was that how the all the layers of it that it's not just the image it's not just the text but that the font has a history and that maybe even the making and the carving of the font has a history and then the paper you choose has a history and something in the what you use to make it or the texture of it and and then the composition itself and how things are arranged I mean they're so complicated in a way that people look at them, it's like oh nice image and a little bit of text with that poem and how sweet that's a bird illustrating the bird poem, but there's all this other um, information in there too, which I think is really fascinating. I think that's a really great point that you can enjoy it on so many levels or get into it as deeply as you want or not. And as a maker, I love that part about it because I can totally geek out. Even if it looks like a simple composition, there's, you know, all the stuff behind it. Your work that's in the show, Spiceography, which was this kind of tour de force, um, it, that's one of the things I love about it is that it is all those layers so that the fonts all, you were, so it's, you know, you should describe your own work, but I love the fact, I mean, for each of the spices that you're talking about, you chose a font that has a history that relates to the history of the spice, and then you made the paper with the spice, and just love that those fonts, the letters, have a history that's just as rich as the, the rest of it. What interested me and kind of got me down that path was comparing the history of spices and the history of typography and finding that both of those valuable commodities went across all these cultures and influenced humanity, really. And so to see, to trace that history and see the overlappage was really what got me going down that path. And then talking about taste, how do you decide what you're going to add to a dish? How do you decide how you're going to design something? And those, I, I realized that felt the same to me, like searching for that flavor. Yeah. So when you organize the show, it looks like you kind of divide it into screen printing, fine printing, letterpress. Did you categorize? We talked about these lines being fluid, and it it feels organized when you go through it. That's funny, I was trying not to do that. I, I guess to some extent, yes, that there's definitely a kind of letterpress section and a book art section, and partly that just happened the way the, the case is laid out. But, what I was really trying to do was look at, do a cross-section through contemporary print arts today and what kinds of interesting new techniques are people using or materials are they printing on that are different. So would find people, it's that fluidity you're talking about that I didn't really expect to find but did, that people who were making books were also making etchings, that people were using all kinds of different techniques in their work that maybe would have been categorized before as something else. And, um, 
and then there were people who were doing some of both or taking it in new ways. So we were just talking about this one artist, Susan Loudermilk, who's a book artist and a printmaker, mostly in woodcuts, but she likes to also turn them into kind of 3D sculptural kinds of objects, so her books are very sculptural, but then she also made this incredible thing called a zoetrope which for me as a 19th century Greek geek was terribly exciting because it's like the first motion picture. Yeah. So it's all these prints inside a giant tub and when you spin it, the things in the image appear to move. So the clocks go around and the horse Horses rocks back rock. and forth, yeah. which was fascinating. And then there are artists like um, Tina Antko who's doing these incredible tiny little lithographs of bugs and flowers and and they seem very kind of classic and traditional. And then she cuts them all out and obsessively attaches them each to the wall with a pin. So it's this crazy kind of physical. That's definitely installation. fantastic <laughs> it's in the beautiful, corner. Beautiful, yeah, yeah, beautiful, crazy thing. And the shadows that it casts. Yeah. yeah it makes it, so it moves out of printmaking into installation, for sure. And there's a lot of people moving back and forth like that. So you know, maybe they, they call it a book, but it really feels like a print to most of us. Or there's that incredible book the Oregon pilgrimage in green that essentially just kind of cascades down off the wall that doesn't even feel like a book anymore. It's just this kind of sea of paper and image. My name is Mauricio Robalino and I like to work with pictures. In the last 25 to 30 years, I've picked up the habit of making stuff with glass. I like to melt glass. I've always liked fire. So this is a very healthy way for me to express my happiness. <laughs> it's an old garage that was totally destroyed before I moved in here. It smelled really bad, it had barely any walls, it had no power, but it was beautiful. It got big windows, good door. We fixed it up and uh, we like to make art here. A lot of us have made a lot of art in this room. During the studio tour, that's the moment when you get to share with the community who you are, what you do. And I've met a lot of really fun people doing it. I had a great time, it makes you feel really good. And I mean, that's it, you know, you feel really good and you never know, you could get a job out of it. I've had lots of offers. The word sharing is really important because that's what I do. Okay, I like sharing. I like sharing what I learn. And kids like it, grown-ups like it. So we have a happy relationship. And I've always known that since I was little, I just like to share. You know, I just like to show people other stuff, how it's done. The color. It's always the color. That's what people always like, the color. They always. A blacksmith is a person that works in black iron, black metal, hence the word goldsmith, silversmith for that metal. So basically it's uh, black iron. The history of blacksmithing basically goes, you know, way back, probably before Roman times. They were manipulating metals two, three thousand years ago, and then it evolved from softer metals like bronze. Uh, into iron, and in the early 1600s in England there was a smelter built to make iron, and it was what we know today as wrought iron, which is probably a piece that would look similar to that. Um, that was easily manipulated with heat and hammers. The unfortunate part about early iron was it wasn't very strong. So as the years progressed, the metals got better and better, 
And the need for a blacksmith to manipulate these metals changed. They went to more mechanized methods, so today we only do it for fun, I think. Growing up in England in a rural area, there were blacksmiths dotted around the, the county. And if my parents didn't know where they were, they knew where I was. I was in the blacksmith shop, so I grew up with this. And I started uh, about eight years old. I started blacksmithing here 33 years ago and have Bill and Volunteer demonstrating the traditional method with coal and, and bellows. And so we tried to portray to the public what it was like back in the 1850s. We make most of the hardware for the fort, door hinges, latches, and gate hardware, and hanging hardware for lamps and stuff like that. Most of the stuff I make would be utilitarian, it'd be something that you can use. Occasionally, a mistake sometimes becomes a piece of art. I had never been to art school, so I, do not, I don't have the, the artistic bent. I can copy somebody's artwork, but that's not you know, what I like to do. So most of my work is functional. There's a lot of interest in smithing, and there's a lot of younger people coming in. And the old timers are teaching them willingly. And this is what I try and do here. One of these days, I'm going to have to say, I, I don't want to be here anymore <laughs> after 33 years. To me, it's a phenomenal, it's almost a thrill every day. I like to forge, you know, it's just, I love it. I think part of being a blacksmith is, some of the time is spent making the tools you need to get where you want to be, to get where you want to go. I'm a sheet metal fabricator. I specialize in making arms and armor, as well as chasing and repose. I started off making armor and props in the film industry, and I really liked making things the real way. And I really got into chasing and repose, as well as engraving and etching, and all this kind of stuff that uh, can decorate these pieces. Chasing repose is a form of decorating sheet metal with chisels and punches, and it's pushing the metal in opposing directions to create relief. I've worked on The Chronicles of Riddick as well as the first G.I. Joe movie. We did stuff first, the new Star Trek movie, Heroes and Lost, and all sorts of stuff with commercials. A lot of what I've learned has been through books and the internet, as well as a lot of trial and error. I'm self taught myself mostly. I find a lot of inspiration from a lot of the old masters, whether it be Celtic or Renaissance or you know, the Japanese art forms. I kind of don't do one particular thing all the time, but I really kind of like all the old traditional kind of styles and arts. I like to be multifaceted in it. That way, uh, if a client comes to me or I want to make something, I see something that I'd like to make, I kind of analyze it and kind of break it down and say, you know, what's the best way to make this? And it might not always be the, the fastest way, but it'll be the best way to achieve what I want the final product to be. I was always kind of too cheap to go out and buy tools, and a lot of them were never available. So I started making my own for whatever I needed. Over time, people started asking me for my tools. So now that's a major facet of my income, is I make and sell chasing and repose tools, and I'm hoping to start making stakes and hammers pretty soon. I'd say I'm on the younger spectrum of metalsmiths. A lot of them are older, but I think there's a lot of young people who are definitely getting into it and getting really good at it. I think there's a, a new breed of craftsmen and artists.
My name is Lynn Danino, and my current art form is uh, tr uh, translating old sweaters into new sweater coats. So I take four or five sweaters and cut them apart and reconfigure them. I spend a lot of time in thrift stores, so I'm inspired by those trips because I find sweaters that have uh, images woven right into them. Or I find really colorful things, things that just spark my imagination. And I seem not to be able to resist colorful, tactile things. My studio would typically look like a pigsty. And when I was working in concrete, it was much worse than it is now. I wouldn't call it a place of inspiration. I would call it a place when you walk into it, you say, oh, when am I ever going to put those door jams on? When am I ever going to finish painting it? How do I think this studio reflects me? Um, for one thing, there are a few pictures in here that uh, professional photographers have taken of me and I like to ham it up, so those pictures are an example of that. And then, um, I'm shy about saying this, but it's the truth, I'm known for having this wild hair that I really have nothing to do with, it's just the way it is. And I think my studio uh, reflects that, it's kind of out of control in here. I have a feeling a lot of artists are just like me. They're working in a space that needs a lot of work, but they'd rather make their art. My name is Amy Reeves and I am the owner of Tacoma Metal Arts Center where we teach jewelry making classes and metal smithing classes. The goal is to be a creative and inspiring place for jewelry makers and metal smiths. I've been teaching for 10 years and making jewelry for about 20 years. One of the reasons I love teaching is that I do find the fresh perspective that students bring very inspiring and, and I am often influenced by what they do in my work. Each project produces its own challenges and that's kind of the, the problem solving aspect of it is a lot of the enjoyment of metalsmithing for me. I've lived in Tacoma since 2004. I was trying to teach a few beginning classes at the different community college continuing education programs. They went pretty well, so people wanted to progress with that, and I figured, why not try it in my own community? And the response has been really positive. And actually, my inspiration to open was seeing the last Metallurge Festival happen in the summer of 2009. And there were so many great events, so many students heard of the classes through the Metallurge, and they thought it was such a cool thing. The response was so positive, I thought, why not? This would be the perfect time to try. So I did, five years ago, and it's been great. Two Raven Studios has been in operation for five years now. Right now we have eight employees and we're dealing with over a hundred artists. This foundry primarily cast in bronze, although we do work with some artists that cast in aluminum. Artists find us by word of mouth. Once you're a, an established foundry, the artists will find out through other artists who's casting their work and that's how they kind of network and, and find foundries. 
all through our casting process, the artists are encouraged to come in and either check their uh, wax work to make sure that it's exactly how they want the finished piece to look. We do any alterations at that time, depending on what they want. We also encourage them to come in when metal is done so that they can do a metal check. And once again, that's just to make sure that through the process, nothing has been overlooked. And then, depending on whether we've worked with that client before, we'll have them come in and sit through the patina process where they can really fine tune the final coloring and shading on the piece. Right now, I'm actually involved through the paid arts program sculpting a series of buoy balls that will be going down on the waterfront near the Esplanade building. I'm capturing a bunch of different local sea life and incorporating them into the buoy balls and so that'll be coming this fall. So far Tacoma has had a big glass influence. I think that there's definitely room for other mediums in Tacoma and I like the fact that we're kind of part of that and hopefully pushing it a little bit more in that direction. I like Tacoma for the working artist. It's, the spaces are more affordable than say surrounding cities like Seattle. The city has been really easy to work with. That's part of the reason we're actually in this building was through working with the Tacoma Arts Commission and uh, they assisted in us finding a location. So I think uh, I think it's continuing to evolve and to grow and there's just more and more opportunities for, for Tacoma based artists to actually uh, get their work out there. My name is Lynn Farron. Uh, my medium is mixed medium, which means a multitude of things. When I make art, I use a lot of um, found objects, found materials. So anything could be turned into art. I love thrift stores or maybe a flea market, or anywhere I can find unusual, odd things. I never know where I find inspiration. I think I've, it's just in my head all the time. Um, that's a question that usually artists get asked, and people always do ask me where I find inspiration. And it's just, it's just there. I think I find inspiration from everything, and maybe not one specific thing, I'm just thinking of things all the time, and they just kind of pop in my head. <laughs> when people come to the studio, I have a hard time knowing what their reaction is sometimes, because sometimes people come in and they don't really even look at anything. And then other people think they love to come in to see everything. So I never can, I can never tell what people think when they come in here because I think it's really unusual in here because I have so many odd things and I've been here for 20 years and I have it so filled up that I probably can't move anywhere else. <laughs> I don't know how I would move. Just recently, I signed with London Tone Music, which is affiliated with London Bridge Studios up in Seattle. I'm going to be working with a historic studio with a historic producer, and uh, I'm going to see what happens with my music. I played sports until I was about seven, and I just did not like it at all, and I wasn't good at them. My mom suggested, well, why don't you try music? It's kind of the next logical thing to do after sports. So I said, okay, and then, uh, you know, she suggested I try guitar and uh, I started taking lessons and it just kind of took off from there. The first
first time on stage, I performed Folsom Prison Blues with a friend of the family's band. And I felt what it was like to be on stage, and I was like, this is, this is what I want to do. My style of music, I would say, is probably a mix between rock, pop, funk, and blues. I kind of write what I feel, and uh, I don't really like to put necessarily a, a category on it, because I like to, I'm still young, I got you know, things to experiment with. So. Performing is above anything is my favorite thing to do. It's my it's my passion, and when I'm up there, I, I just focus on bringing the fire, you know. And uh, it's people love it. I just want to play in front of as many people as I can. I want my music to be heard, and impact as many people's lives as I, you know, I can. If I could play with anybody, it'd be Paul McCartney. If I grew up on stage and play yesterday with Paul McCartney, that's like my all-time dream. So. Well, my mom played a guitar, a little bit. My dad played piano. My grandma played piano, a great sight reader. My grandpa was an accomplished violinist. So there was music always around the house. Finally, they got me a, a guitar for Christmas. It had strings so high up on the neck, it was almost impossible to play. <laughs> but I managed, and my dad paid for lessons. I took a date, Cheryl Albert, up to the CPS field house, and Chuck Berry opened the show. And then my hair just stood on end. I said, yes, now we got the idea. Now it makes sense. So I went home and you couldn't get the guitar out of my hand ever since. <laughs> the Sonics lived right across the alley from me, uh, Rob Lind. We'd both take a break and go out in the alley. And I'd say, yeah, I'm gonna have records out, you know, one of these days. And Rob would say, yeah, well, so am I. And to this day, we do. <laughs> which is pretty good. <laughs> All right. right after high school, which I didn't quite finish at Wilson, I went down to Texas and played with Bobby Fuller. I fought the law and the law won. But I didn't stay there for very long. They were so clean and I was so funky. You know, and uh, I wanted to come back here and play the blues with my friends. You know, downtown Broadway was the, the place. Back with the Frantics playing over here with Joe Carbone at the uh, Hi-Hat. We decided the uh, Frantics was gonna go down there and play in San Francisco. We went down there, we got the job at the Dragon of Go go in San Francisco in Chinatown. And we were doing 10 sets a night. Everybody else's songs, none of our own. We weren't writing. Then we went and had a peek at the Longshoreman's Hall and the Avalon and the Fillmore to see what's going on. And they had the Grateful Dead and the Jefferson Airplane, Stop with Camel. And we said, hey, wait a minute. Maybe we can get into this level. We decided we're just gonna have to break up to reform. So we broke up, got rid of those stupid suits, and uh, started hanging out with those guys. And then Bob went down to LA, and uh, he bumped into Peter Lewis. And uh, then another band began to start happening, which was Moby Grape. So they called me and Don up, who were living together in San Carlos, 
and asked if we would be into playing with them. She said, well, oh, sure, yeah, we love you guys. And we played together and it was like magic. Just, it was like nothing I'd ever been exposed to before. And I remember on the way home, me and Don were just laughing and saying, now we got something. This really makes sense, because everybody wrote, everybody sang, and everybody played. And we all got along real good. And, uh, I mean, it was just a wonderful situation. It was nice to finally get onto that level, you know, of the Fillmore and the Avalon and Winterland. <laughs> Number 16 on here is the one I like. See if I can find it. Nolan! <laughs> What's up? Tell me, what do you like to play? Uh, it's strange because yeah. there's things I like to write, yeah. and there's things I like to play. Yeah. And they're, and they're kind of two different things. Yeah. I'm a big fan, I like writing slower songs. Yeah. Like more slow on the acoustic. Yeah. But um, as far as playing live, I just like playing just like, you Let know, her have it. Yeah, raw, yeah, rock and I roll. I noticed that you know. about you. Yeah. yeah. You get down. So. You do pretty good there, pal. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. It all just kind of depends. Yeah. What about your influences? Well, I mean, my favorite guitar player, uh, one of his biggest influences on me is Jimi Hendrix. Yeah. I heard yeah. the Live at the Fillmore. Yeah. Uh, the Power to Soul. Oh, sure. And just, you know, they have that bump, yeah. and then it comes with the bow, yeah. and then, uh, that yeah. I was kind of opened my eyes. So he's a good influence, and uh, I yeah. loved it. He he picked up on, uh, you know, and innovated so much. Oh yeah, and just his you know. his performance. Because I'm a big yeah. I'm a big fan of performance, yeah. and uh, I like putting on a show. And yeah, you know, he just did it, and he I, he didn't do it. I don't think because he just did it because that's what he felt. Yeah. Didn't because he felt like he had to do it, or yeah. it was a gimmick or something. Just because yeah. that's what he did. Yeah, you know? yeah, he felt it. I also, I'm a big fan of the uh, I like Paul McCartney and the Beatles. Yeah. Yeah. Lovely. The writing was just unbelievable. The writing was great, yeah. I had to play one time in front of Ringo and George. Wow. About froze. You know, <laughs> sitting out there looking at those guys. Right. And we come in here. Do you, you play here once in a while, huh? Yeah. Yeah. This is where I first uh, had my first live performance. Yeah. Well, well no, this was. Is that on a Wednesday is when they have the. Yeah, this, this is where I, well, this is where I first started performing at when I was starting to get into I yeah. came here. So I went and actually, first time I ever saw like live music, I came here, saw the Randy Oxford band. Oh, yeah. And, you know, Raphael, Tranquilino. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I saw him playing guitar. I was like, whoa. Yeah. And it's kind of, you know, being able to jam with him and stuff, that's yeah. been pretty cool. Yeah, that is pretty cool. Want to play just a hair of Stormy Monday? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. KG? Sure. 
get a little volume in. Okay. got the 90s grunge scene, I mean, back in the old days yeah. with the rock and roll, Jimi yeah. Hendrix, I mean, it's all oh, yeah. been a little more edgy uh -huh. and yeah, a little and more rock and roll. A lot more else. instrumental, yeah. I thought, rather than uh, vocalists. Matter of fact, in the old days, a vocalist was almost kind of considered a sissy. You know? <laughs> if, you, if you sang, oh no, he's singing, oh no. If how about you, what got you into the blues? Well, Jimmy? <laughs> no, I, it was from, I, I don't really consider myself a, a blues artist. Uh -huh. I mean, I think my guitar playing uh -huh. just has some blues influence uh -huh. in there. But just from playing the blues was going to the jams and stuff. Yeah. Just because that's what yeah. you play at the jams, yeah. you just play the blues. That's so, right. I, I mean, I started playing, like, yeah. first song I ever learned was Folsom Prison. Oh, yeah. Uh, Johnny Cash. That and then cool. I started learning a lot of, like, classic rock stuff. But yeah. then came to the jams and yeah. did blues. So. Yeah. Well, yeah, we don't know the charts. Exactly. And we get there, so the three chords comes in mighty handy. Mm -hmm. So I wrote a song called Love You So Much, which is the same blues changes, but it's the G, C, and D yeah. in a row. Mm -hmm. Love you so much, just about to drive me crazy. So we could do that instead of the standard. Right. So I, I made it up like that just, just so I could tell somebody that quick. Mm -hmm. For me, uh, when I'm writing songs and stuff, I think that I try to keep blues as a as an underlying base yeah, of sure. my music. Yeah. But then I try to build on top of that. That's what um, I'm talking about. Yeah. yeah. So like I have a song. Yeah. I mean, I have a couple songs that are a little more bluesy. Yeah. Um, but like I just wrote a song called uh, "Step Back," uh -huh. and it's um. pieces of a broken son the last moments of his life I spent looking down the barrel of a gun he's just another number no chance of being someone I think it's time we step back and see what we become yeah and then yeah, there's another verse 
then it goes to the chorus, and it's going to go to the four. This thing goes. Take a step back and look ahead. There are so many things that must be said. I wish that someone would just hold up a mirror. Then we might see ourselves and make it clear. Step back. Go back to the thing. So anyway, so yeah, that's, that's you know, cool. I try to I try yeah. to find that nice balance. Same so. thing, yeah. Yeah. I just love you so much. It's yeah. uh, people can play with it mm -hmm. and hear it. And uh, no modulations. Yeah. <laughs> No, there is. Yeah. We, we did put a ch uh, yeah. key chain, a uh, timing change. We go from yeah. the 4-4, four, four, then we throw like a Beatles 6-8 in the oh, middle. Oh, yeah. So it goes from, we go. Yeah. Step oh, back. Okay. Bum, 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 bum. Yeah, I like those things. Like a roller coaster ride. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Instead of going straight down the freeway, you got a few. Uh, mm -hmm. Moby Grape used to do that, too. Yeah. With uh, ain't no use mm -hmm. and just change the time changes right did that in, in uh, quite a few tunes just trying to come up with something that's that's not there's nothing straight about moby grape really yeah <laughs> it's all kind of but uh, it takes a lot of rehearsal when when you're modulating and change time changes and stuff no it does i mean it's, yeah. it takes a lot of rehearsal anyways yeah yeah so yeah to if, you're, if you're gonna do anything yeah yeah exactly if you're just gonna play the blues you had this guy a friend of mine benny rowe he got the gig with uh John Lee Hooker, mm -hmm. and he says, John Lee, when do we rehearse? John Lee says, rehearse? He says, you got ears, don't you? <laughs> but you know, you ought to know John Lee's, what he does. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. So this is one big pleasure sitting here with you. Likewise. Yeah, this thank you. It was a lot you. of fun. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Rocket and my medium is my medium is acrylic and mixed media and I teach intuitive painting classes using tempera and paper. Intuitive painting is painting from your intuition. It's all about the process. It's not about any concern at all for what the outcome is going to be. Um, and so it sort of frees you up from trying to produce something and it lets you talk to your, your intuition and and learn how to access it when you need it. The studio feels very free to me, and just the space, the way it's laid out, just the, I don't know, the, the whiteness, or the, I don't know if it's the history of the building, or the way that there's, it's a rough structure, you can still see the beams. Um, it just feels really free in here. And like, one of the things we do in classes, and I do on my own, to just to get the creativity moving, is to move. So there's space to move. It does inspire me. Um, like I said, it feels really good here, so it's really easy to stay here and work through the process, because sometimes the process takes a while. <laughs> Inspiration doesn't just strike. Um, and then just the light is really inspirational. And I've also added a lot of colorful things, like there's some boas that I've hung around just so I don't take myself so seriously, and little tchotchkes and little dolls and any, anything that has color in it because it's beautiful white walls to sort of make, make them pop. So that helps me get more into the, the mood. Um, my studio inspires people. They just walk in and they can feel how, how it feels. I mean, it just feels great, but they also get really drawn toward the windows and um, the view is very exciting for them. And it's also a very calm place to be. People have told me they feel safe here and that, that feels good.